When I was not quite three, I got drunk. That's the first thing I remember in my whole life. I was wearing a long shirt that folks called a dress, and it was Christmas. The time when aunts and uncles gathered to celebrate with all the liquor they could hold. There was plenty that Christmas, enough even for Uncle Tom and his nine who were visiting us. Coffee lace, ginger stew, eggnog, and plain hard liquor. I had never felt so good in my whole life until my stomach suddenly spun. The grown-ups told me to hurry outside, but I was too drunk to find the door. I tripped over my dress, fell and hit my head, and dropped off into sleep. Sometime during the night, I lost my shirt, and I woke up naked as a jaybird with a hangover. But that didn't matter, the grown-ups told me. It was fine, just fine, to be drunk. Brandy was God in our cabin. It was Brandy that made the life bearable. Now, food eased the stomach, but Brandy filled the whole spirit. Twice a week, a horse-drawn liquor wagon made its rounds past our cabin from the state-licensed distillery across the mountain. The most it could leave at one time was a runlet. That's just a shade under five gallons. And Pa, he often took the full amount. We lived in Virginia on the eastern slope of the Appalachian Mountains, just above the North Carolina border. In a place called the Hollow is a crescent-shaped area about 30 miles long and 20 wide, walled in by the mountains. My father Babe was a big, red-faced, boisterous man, generous and kind, a jokey fella that everyone liked. His ancestors were Scotch-Irish, who had lived in these hills for three generations. Pa's parents never got around to giving him a name other than Babe, and my ma said it was just as well, for as big as he was, he never really grew up. Pa was a liquor head. Now, he worked hard whenever he was sober, as a timber cutter or a farmhand in the tobacco fields or the apple orchards lower down in the valley. But that wasn't enough that he could feed all nine of us children. At one place, he got 50 cents a day if he'd take half in pork at 25 cents a pound. And no job lasted long. As a result, we never did own any land or even a cabin. We were always on the move forced out of one cabin after another for not paying rent. Sometimes there wasn't a bite of food in the house, but there was always brandy. One year, Paul tried running his own distillery, but he couldn't make a go of it because there was seldom any surplus to sell. My mother was a tall and slim lady with fair skin and black hair. She was pure Irish. And she was sad most of the time. She worked hard, even when she felt poorly. She was washing clothes for people for 25 cents a day and keeping the dirt floor of our cabin swept clean. Now, Ma was a heavy drinker too, like many women in the holler. First thing every day, she and Pa would have a morning's dram, a few gulps right from the bottle, just as regularly as they pulled their clothes on. Later, at breakfast, Ma would pass the bottle around the table to the rest of us kids. Her mother had told her it was good for the children and it kept away diseases. And Ma could repeat her mother's teachings word for word, like many mountain people who had never learned to read. You see, I was born on the night of January 19th, 1890. A real old-timey mountain blizzard was howling across the mountains. My oldest brother, John, was 14, and he ran down the mountain to get the granny woman. She was a tall lady and was the only sort of doctor we knew. She threw a shawl around her shoulders and set off with John through the mountain drifts. Now, to this granny woman, every baby was a miracle of God, and the folks in the holler said she had never lost one, though she had birthed at least a thousand of them. She never lost a mother either. Now, I don't know it for sure, but my ma was peaceful when she saw the granny woman come through the door. But my birth was hard on Ma. She was thin and weak from going hungry for the sake of all of us youngins. And I was a big baby. My Ma told me she tried hard to keep me alive. She had so little milk 
and I had to call it real bad. She'd dip a piece of rag in molasses and then brandy and give it to me to suck to ease the pain of the colic. She would have weakened the brandy with sugar, but sugar was a luxury we couldn't afford. So she tried to keep me eased with the brandy until spring, hoping both of us would feel better by then. But she didn't. Once the spring arrived, something happened to Ma that I never knew about until my brother John told me a few years ago. John had noticed how sad-eyed Ma was getting. She would walk in the cold woods for hours, and she would often forget to make meals. John worried to himself about her. He was always the serious one, and my Pa was mostly too drunk to notice things. John, even at 14, was sort of the man of the family. One day John was walking to the mill with a bag of corn on his shoulder when he saw a wagon approaching. It had Ma in it, sitting between the sheriff and the deputy. She was handcuffed and sobbing. John put down the corn mill and he planted himself right in the middle of the road, holding his gun. Now he was a lean spur of a boy, but some things you just knew to do without being told. Let go of my Ma, he said. The sheriff just prodded the horse to push him out of the way. Let go of my ma, he said again, and he lifted his gun. The sheriff stopped. We're taking her where she can't harm nobody. We've noticed she's just been wandering around, and neighbors don't know what she's a doing. John looked up at the two men. My ma's a sick woman. She had a young in this winter, and he leveled his gun at the sheriff, drew back the hammer, and deepened his voice. You move any further and I'll kill you both. The sheriff must have known Mountaineers well enough to know when a threat was real. So he hesitated. Then he loosened the handcuffs and held Pa off the wagon. The men whipped the horses and hurried down the hill. John put his arm around Ma, who was still crying, and they walked home alone. You see, that's just how bad things were for Ma the first year of my life. As summer deepened, the food was more plentiful, and Ma's spirits and strength returned. They say I picked up too and got brown as a berry from the sun. Our home, at best, couldn't be called a happy one. My Ma seemed to pick a quarrel with my Pa any time he came in the house, whether he was drunk or sober. And my happy-go-lucky Pa, he was also high-tempered and he would fight back. Sometimes it seemed like they hated each other. Now, people in the holler took babies as much for granted as the coming of spring. If one died, folks would just say, well, it was meant to be, and when a thing is meant to be, there ain't no use to fret. But if a kid died who was getting some stretch to his legs, a man might think, even if he didn't say it, man, that's a shame. He was getting big enough to work. Now, this wasn't the case with my folks. They loved every one of us, and they were good parents, as good as they knew how to be. They hadn't been to school a day in their lives, but they were clean, and they kept us clean, and that wasn't common in the holler. Most of the folks didn't have the wash rag habit. Now, Paul, he would carve out little play pretties for us boys and corncob dolls for the girls. Us kids respected our sad-faced mother, but it was our big, bolsterous father that we really loved. After me, came two more babies, so there were five boys and four girls growing up in a one-room cabin. We had a stone fireplace that cooked our food and warmed the room, too, and we generally only had one window that didn't have any glass, only shutters to keep the cold out. There'd be a washstand in one corner and a homemade table with two or three oak-split chairs in the center. It was crowded all right, but we never thought about it. Heck, one cabin nearby had 16 children, the only time we felt crowded is when my Uncle Tom and his nine kids would come for the night. They made 22 of us in one cabin. It was food that we were short of. Every day was different. Most days were hungry. Some were full. 
There was plenty of apples while they lasted, but without jars to preserve them in, that wasn't long. In the winter, we lived mostly on hominy and cornbread, on strips of hog or deer, or rabbit meat that hung in the smoke of the chimney, and on rings of dried pumpkin that was strung from the ceiling. But this would give out before spring, and there were lean, cold months before summer came, before we could get grazing on the wild berries and vegetables. You see, we were the poorest in a place where everybody was poor. If we came to a neighbor's house at mealtime, the family would jump up from the table and the mother would spread a dish towel over the food, explaining that they had just finished. We didn't blame them. We knew that family came ahead of friends and neighbors, ahead of everything else. A man's family was his kingdom. Loyalty to family was the first commandment of these mountains. Even at the grist mill, when my brother scraped a little meal from the rim of an empty bin, the miller chased him away. You see, generosity was a luxury, something for rich people. It seems I was most always hungry. Many times I'd go outside and I'd look at the mountains. Someday, I'm going to climb there to the top where the stars lived. There, there'd be food and everything else that I longed for. There was one time a year when we all had food. That was in the late fall after the gusty winds of a chestnut storm left the ground strewed with nuts. Pa and Ma would take us out by lantern light to beat the hogs to them. For the hogs knew every tree just as well as the humans did. Those chestnuts would stain our hands and our feet a dark brown that nothing but time could remove. But no one minded. My brother John said that the chestnuts were like manna from God, just like when he fed the Israelites. One day in June, when I was six years old, a stranger came walking up the side of Hard Smith's Mountain, where we lived. She was a young lady with big, dark eyes and a quick smile. And I thought, I've never in my whole life seen anyone so beautiful. She asked where my folks were, and I explained they were away working, but I'd be quick to fetch my big brother. I raced up the ridge where John was grubbing some thorns on the face of a mountain, and we hurried back. The lady said her name was Miss Sally, and that the Quakers from a college in North Carolina had sent her to start a school here in the holler. Heck, even a Sunday school too. My brother John promised her that we would bring all the other children. I remember I spoke up in my biggest voice and I said, I'm six years old. And Miss Sally just laughed and said, we'll try to find room for you too. Now, my ma was angry when she heard about this. Five miles in the morning and at night was too far for young ones to walk. Besides, what good would school be? And who was this woman? But my brother John was hard to talk out of anything. Now, Ma, we know you love them youngins like a sow loves her pigs. But you see, I want to make something out of these kids. The next week, he herded all six of us down the road to school, two hours away, carrying me on his shoulders when I got tired. And now and then, he would play the harp to amuse us. Now, this school was the first glimmer of education to ever penetrate this hollow and Miss Sally quickly became the most important person in my life. I loved school, and Sunday school, too. The Old Testament heroes were my favorite, especially Daniel. I already knew about the lions. Sometimes at night they screamed on the ridge above my cabin. And one morning on the way to school, I saw one slip behind a boulder near the path. Most of my brothers and sisters got tired of Sunday school, but not me. I never missed. And when spring came, Miss Sally gave me a pair of red suspenders as an attendance prize. I had never seen any before. I didn't even know what they were. All my classmates just laughed at me. He's wearing a shirt tail dress. He ain't even got no use for him. When my ma heard the joke that night, she hurried to her sewing basket where she kept scraps of cloth. And in the firelight of the hearth, she sewed them together like the golden calf that Aaron made of jewelry that his people brought him. Now, there was no music or dancing to celebrate that day. 
But when I put on my first pair of knee breeches, it was all in my heart. The rest of my brothers and sisters might have gone to school more often, except for the humiliation of our raggedy clothes and the meager lunch pail that my big sister would carry. Sometimes, the only thing we had was milk with cornbread crumbled into it. Other days, there'd be nothing but one biscuit apiece. At lunch, when all the school was gathered underneath the oaks to eat, my sister would slide the cover back a little bit and reach in for the biscuits, and she'd dole them out to us one at a time. When they were all gone and the lunch pail was empty, she'd ask each one of us, Wouldn't you like something more? And each one of us would reply, Nope, had a plenty. You see, a mountain child, even though his stomach was hurting from hunger, he had his pride to think of. When my father heard how we were all full in one biscuit, he would just laugh his loud laugh. To me, it seemed that he often laughed the loudest when he was hurt the most. Well, some laugh more than when this life is over. The big event in the mountains, one that everybody went to, was a primitive Baptist funeral. You see, mountaineers were normally reserved, yet at these funerals they would give themselves up to wailing and weeping. Even grown men sobbed and moaned. Funerals were actually festivals that brought in thousands, sometimes 2,000 people on foot and horseback, even by oxen. If an old man died, there might be a wait of a couple years for his widow to die and then there'd be a double funeral. On such an occasion, the family would serve dinner to all the friends and neighbors and relatives. Now you gotta remember, in the mountains, we'd all recognize kinship up to the 32nd cousin. And the more preachers, the better. Usually there were four or five of them, and it went on all day. The message seldom varied. I remember one time a preacher ended a prayer by saying, in heaven, there'll be plenty of possums and sweet taters and brandy. For heaven wouldn't seem right without him. Now, at that time, my pa was already outside having a foretaste of that heaven. After the service, one preacher came out and shared a bottle with my pa. But for me, it was hard for me to know what to believe in. Haunts and visitations seem more real than church religion. Folks in these mountains saw strange sights. Other people possessed strange powers. If a long past midnight a glass fell from the table and rolled across the room and broke, a man would say to his wife, I've got a coffin to make in the morning. And it seemed he always did. Another neighbor woman might throw out her dishwater at night and hear a sound like somebody throwing down a shoulder load of planks that cover a coffin. And she would say, Tom, there'll be a burying tomorrow. And sure enough, it seemed there was. Sometimes, in the fogs that hush the holler, the spirit world seemed more real than life itself. I kept picturing God in white like the ghost folks kept talking about. And though I kept going to Miss Sally's Sunday school, I was just as devout in mountain superstitions. I kept a piece of lead and string around my neck to keep from the nosebleed. I buried a hair from my dog's ear and one from his tail to keep him from running away. My brother John, he didn't believe in stuff like that. He ridiculed Ma for switching the cream to chase out witches. John would eat the berries out of a graveyard to prove to all of us that he wouldn't die of the bloody flux. Me, I never outgrew some of those old superstitions. Even today, strange sounds at night will bring me bolting upright, and foggy nights make me very uneasy. Before long, my brother John began taking over his head of the family, and we had a little more to eat. He rented a patch of ground for beans, and he had us stringing beans all through the middle of the pod to dry. We picked pails and pails of wild berries. 
John bought chickens and saw to it that we had the extra eggs traded at the store. He got a job as a timber cutter, and he promised Pa that someday he'd buy him a farm. But even with John in charge, we all still drank and got into trouble for it. John himself would come home with bruises, though we had never heard of anybody who bested him. I looked up to John. I wanted to be like him. I used to beg to go out with him, but he would never let me. When I was 13, I got the second pair of pants I ever owned, knee breeches made of wool that my mother had spun. Along with them, I got the first pair of shoes I'd ever had, bought with chestnut money. I was in seventh grade by now, and I loved school as much as ever. Some mornings, I'd come in an hour early just to talk to Miss Sally alone. She'd tell me stories about her home and her parents in North Carolina, and I did everything I could to please her. I memorized dozens of poems because I knew she liked them, and I read every book that she bought me. The year I turned 14, my brother John married and he left home. Boy, I missed him terribly. And then a few months later, Miss Sally married a preacher, and she left the holler for good. I mourned her almost as if she had died, and I didn't go back to school again. It was about this time that I started my hell raising. I already knew how to claw and bite and kick where it did the most damage. Now I practiced throwing rocks, so it counted. Being able to rock an adversary was a mighty useful skill, and there was never a lack of ammunition. There were jagged rocks the size of your fist. In my first big fight, a rock caught me behind the ear, and it knocked me out and nearly killed me. I learned to fight mean, mountain style, from the ambush. I longed to be grown up. Here I was, still in knee breeches, with the fuzz on my face getting dark and thick, but I had no gun. Someday, I'd have long pants, and I'd own my own pistol, and I'd be feared. The year I was 15, John bought a farm for my father and a cabin. It was the first that my pa had ever owned. Pa was so moved that he decided to give up drinking, and he did. And just a few months later, he died of pneumonia. All the laughter and fun was gone from our house now. My ma, she grieved in a way I couldn't believe over someone she hadn't really seemed to like. Me, I was drinking more and more now and going along with my big brother Sam, joining up with the other boys whose sap was on the horizon. Sam had to stay sober enough to look after me, for I was always getting into trouble. Now Sam, he was a peaceful boy, but he could lick any boy in a holler that threatened me, and I was right proud of the way Sam could fight. Sometimes I'd start a ruckus just to see what would happen. One Sunday, there were 17 boys and I started some trouble. My brother Sam jumped in and started fending for me. Soon, everyone was after us. Sam picked up a rock and he knocked a boy out. We ran for it as the rocks bombarded after us for a mile before we escaped. It was then and there that Sam announced he was through fighting for me and that I would have to look out for myself. Soon after, with the first $5 bill I had ever held in my hands that I earned from cutting timber, I walked seven miles to Mount Airy and I bought my first pair of long pants. They cost me $2. Then I went to a gun shop and I knew exactly what I wanted. An Ivor Johnson 32 caliber nickel plated pocket revolver with a four inch barrel and an owl's head on the grip. It cost me exactly $2. I bought a hundred cartridges for 30 cents. The time had come. I was finally a man. I started teaming up with my big cousin Jess. He was 12 years older than me, and he was one of the meanest men in the holler. I liked the way people looked at us when we walked into the woods to cut logs. We were tough not to be messed with. On Sundays, we would join others at some steel where we gambled and drank with our guns at our sides. Once, I was watching a poker game when two friends started arguing over a five cent steak. In a flash, one shot the other dead. And at the funeral, the preacher said, this is a fearsome thing 
But since it's the Lord's will, it had to be done. And man, he's got nothing to do with it. He dies when his time comes, and he can't before. Heck, I didn't know what to believe. I wondered what the Lord had planned for me. Would I kill a man or be killed? A month later, I was playing cards by candlelight in a tobacco barn. All of a sudden, a short man jumped up and stabbed a man twice his size in the neck. The big man died. There didn't seem to be any reason why it happened. And it was like that many times. A small argument, a secret resentment, or an imagined slight, and a man would be dead. We had no family feuds, no hatreds passed down from father to son. I couldn't figure it all out. Sometimes, I would look at the top of the mountains, and I would think that up there I'd find the answers, so I'd climb up. But it never helped much. I was getting a reputation for being known as a hell raiser. Most of the time, I was either drunk or sobering up. One day, I was playing cards at a blacksmith's shop with a half dozen friends when one of them hit me over the head with a whiskey bottle. When I came to hours later, it was dark, and all of my friends, even my cousin, had all left me. My head was throbbing, and all my hair was sticky with blood. But my heart is what it was hurting the most. Wasn't there one of my friends who even cared whether I lived or died? I wondered if friendship was just a pretty word. Now, my brother John, he was a heavy drinker too, and a fighter. And he could put away whole bottles, but he never got wild drunk or came home hurt. One day he said to me, I believe the drink is bad. I believe it makes a little man biggity and a big man a fool. I believe I'm going to give it up. Me? I couldn't have been more surprised that if he said he was quitting the mountains, he told me he was going to become a county police officer. Well, I kept right on drinking and fighting. I got my jaw broken in a fight. Although it mended all right, there's still a deep scar on my cheek to this day. Often, my friends and I would take our guns and we'd fire back at each other for fun. Looking back, I wonder how I was never killed or seriously wounded. I mean, I was shot once in the leg and once in the shoulder, but they were surface wounds and they healed up. Yet, time and again, I saw men kill each other. Men without hate in their systems, but they'd be drunk with guns and knives were always handy. By the time I was 20, I was hardly ever sober, not even in the morning. But I was miserable and sick in my soul. For days at a time, I wouldn't eat a decent meal. My cousin and I, we got to whipping out our pistols and daring men to shoot us, hoping sometimes that they would. Once a man did yank out his gun and he held it with both hands, he aimed and he fired at me from less than 10 feet away. I wondered, why didn't I feel any pain? Why didn't I fall? And then I realized he was drunk and he had missed. I started crying. It's hard for me to tell you the agony I felt those days, except to say, that twice, I went into the woods and I put my pistol to my temple. But each time, I put it down. I can't tell you why. Then, one day, after playing cards and drinking for hours, I found myself six miles from home outside a little church. I don't know how I got there, but I could hear singing. I went inside and I sat down. It was a Methodist church and a revival was going on. I don't remember how it happened. But when the altar call happened, something inside me urged me to go forward. And as I knelt down, I didn't feel any sudden revelation, only a sense of peace. For the first time in my life, it seemed, I rested. That night, I slept like a child without having a single pull of brandy. And the next morning, I took my pistol off. I didn't want it anymore. For the first time, I felt a power stronger than the power of liquor and rocks and guns. Friend, the end it must be near, for it seems that I can hear God's mighty army gathering in the sky. The sound of chariots made of fire, angels dressed in white. 
time, just a twinkling of an eye.